So is it full screen? Yes. Yeah. All right. And it looks like we are live. I'll let y'all go. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Texas Community College Teachers Association, uh, Richard Moore and team for inviting us to uh, co-host a presentation. We're gonna talk about a little bit more details um, on the Texas Success Initiative, TSIA2, and some developmental education updates. Next slide. I'm here with my colleague, Assistant Director, Keelan Morgan. And uh, like you're probably familiar with us, we're from the Division of College Readiness and Success from the Higher Ed Coordinating Board. Next slide. So here uh, is a, a quick presentation overview. Um, we're gonna speak a little bit about the COVID waiver and multiple measures assessment. Uh, then uh, the TSIA2 implementation updates and some coordinating board updates. Uh, some data regarding Hospital 2223 co-requisite outcomes. Uh, just a few comments about what's happening, the latest things going on at the coordinating board, and then we'll end with, with a Q&A period. Next slide. So I'm gonna jump right in. As you know, since uh, I believe it was last April, our commissioner Harrison Keller had approved the use of uh, multiple measures assessment, or also another way to look at it is to allow um, uh, ways to assess students and to determine their best placements outside of existing rules. And um, we just wanna remind everyone that uh, these the existing rules are still in place and are still applicable, but um, you, an institution may uh, use additional rules or additional indicators. The most common indicator, for example, would be use of high school GPA. And there's a lot of data that really um, confirms that even self-reported GPA and even up to the 11th grade uh, especially when considering for dual credit purposes, those are also still valid, regardless of, you know, sometimes we hear at some uh, high schools, a GPA uh, means, or is it a little bit different, a little more meaningful than at other high schools, even all of those considerations, it's really more a testament about um, a, a long-term way of determining whether the students have not only the knowledge and skills, but also those, what we call those, uh, those soft skills and whether they pers persevere, whether they attend class, whether they submit assignments on time. So those are the types of assessments um, and indicators that most institutions are using in Texas. And again, we just wanna remind everyone that if it is an indicator that's already an existing rule, that those do not change and uh, the COVID waiver does not allow uh, for institutions to modify those. And we have a quick example here for example, if a student meets a TSI exemption for math, 530 on the SAT math portion, uh, an institution cannot then also require an additional indicator that's not already spelled out in current rule. Next slide. So um, when we talk about multiple measures, uh, placement and assessment, we are highly encouraging institutions, if you have multiple, uh, uh, indicators. So even if you have a TSIA score for a student who does not meet the benchmark, of course, if the student meets the benchmark as before, as prior to the COVID waiver, that student would be considered college ready and uh, should be able to go in any college level, entry level college course without any further restriction. But for those students who don't meet, meet the benchmark, whether you have a score or not, we really encourage institutions to um, use whatever other indicators that will result in the student's highest placement. Next slide. So the one thing that we have learned, you know, we've heard this term, this, this uh, you know, this, this phrase, this, uh, this term over and over, one size does not fit all. And that is absolutely also true when we talk about uh, placement of students. So the best way that we think, especially in terms of addressing equity, is, uh, and then the best way to address students' range of knowledge and skills is to vary the co-requisite options. So what we call on the left here, we've got an examples of a minimal intervention. And these are for students who are near college ready. Now, what does that mean? Faculty at your institutions should be able to determine what that is. For example, we uh, recommend um, a, a placement within four, year, uh, four points of college readiness. Um, because that's the standard error of, of measurement when we talk about the actual assessment. So that would be one indicator 
uh, to classify a student as near college ready. Uh, one to two maximum SCH um, in the form of NCBOs. That's what we uh, really think is a best practice because those are the most flexible. And remember, if it is a co-requisite, you still have to place the student in something in addition to that college level course so that two so that the student does have those two enrollments. Now, whether you charge the student for the support enrollment, that's completely up to your institution. Um, now, again, whether you charge the student is up to you, but remember whether you charge the student or not, you can still submit for funding for that intervention component. And of course, for the college level portion as well. So with NCBOs, again, with this minimum inter minimal intervention, we really try to focus on um, technology-based supports, supplemental instruction, tutoring, and especially those interventions that are already there and available, not necessarily building something new, maybe adding more, more uh, time where it's available, especially for our adult learners on the weekends and in the evenings. Um, but really the, the key there is uh, having the college level faculty track the student to ensure that they are engaging in those minimal interventions and also making sure that they have a learning plan so that they're really targeting what they're doing during that tutoring and supplemental instruction time. On the right hand side, you'll see an example of a more robust intervention, and these would be appropriate for the least prepared. Um, three uh, SCH, ALP is a real common uh, example, very, very, you know, highly uh, researched. Um, and then, of course, uh, another option would be a DE course. Next slide. So specifically with math, we do have uh, some placement recommendations. Um, so this is for the student. And by the way, CRC stands for College Readiness Classification. That's basically when we think about the TSIA, we're thinking about the first 20 questions of the assessment. So uh, after that first 20 questions, the student does get a, um, uh, a result, if you will. And if it's lower than 950, 950 is the benchmark. If it's lower than less than 950, then the student does go into one diagnostic. There's only one now from with the TSIA2. And um, if the diagnostic level result is a six, by the way, that student is also college ready. Remember, we now have that second chance opportunity, not only for ELAR, but also for math. So the six would be uh, college ready. Now, diagnostic level five, of course, in code and in rule, that uh, placement must be a co-requisite. However, what we're seeing is many of our students are also assessing at the diagnostic level four. So what's happened is things have shifted down a little bit. Now that the six is college ready, things have shifted down. And so we highly recommend for your institution, especially those students in non-algebra based co-requisites um, to consider a co-requisite, again, for a student with a diagnostic level four. And also uh, for those in an algebra based co-requisite, consider using um, an, perhaps another indicator, maybe like a GPA indicator, uh, to see if a co-requisite algebra-based co uh, option would be the best for the student assessing at level four. So technically, the level four students uh, are not mandated to go into the co-requisite. However, we are tracking that very closely. Next slide. So, uh, so far, what we've seen is we've got... Uh, uh, assessment results, and this, uh, I confirmed, Keelan, that this is results from launch, which was January 11th, 2021, through March. So we had approximately 66,000 administrations in each subject area. The outcomes, we, you know, we've been hearing some, some comments and some feedback from the field that it seems like fewer students are meeting the benchmark. And actually, um, that when we look overall at the results, the, we say outline uh, the outcomes mostly align with the previous version. Um, that's roughly 35% in ELAR and uh, roughly 23% uh, in uh, math. And but we what we are seeing is for those who don't meet the benchmark, a higher number are assessing at diagnostic level four. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we are monitoring this very closely on a monthly basis. We're having meetings with college board uh, researchers and psychometricians, and we're gonna be watching this very closely, especially that diagnostic level four to see how students who are still placed through a prerequisite in a college level course, uh, how those students perform. So that's definitely on our radar. Next slide. 
Uh, and then I just wanted to remind everyone that we did have a board meeting, uh, the, the board meeting from October 22nd, which was last fall. Um, two things that were on the agenda. Uh, the first thing, of course, is that we did the presentation um, related to the TSIA2, and the board approved those benchmarks. Uh, and of course, that uh, assessment launched on January 11th in 21. And then the other component was that uh, scaling of the co-requisite models to 100% of students who are uh, at least at level five diagnostic. And uh, that is still applicable beginning this fall. But as we noted, since quite a few students are still assessing at that level four um, in the diagnostic uh, for the math, we're actually seeing a potential, we're, we're uh, concerned about a potential reduction of students actually uh, being enrolled in co-requisite models. And that's why we ask institutions to really look at those other indicators that are available for use now to see if not those, uh, that level four student wouldn't actually probably likely do well and thrive in a co-requisite. Next slide. So um, one other thing that I want to call your attention, and this is going to be at, um, it's actually the, uh, yes, the April 22nd board meeting, which is in a couple of weeks, or actually it's already next week. Um, we are going to be submitting a proposal for the two high school equivalency tests, the GED and the HiSET. Um, for those to be uh, qualified for a TSI exemption. And you can see here, this is the, we just copied the exact language that we are submitting to the board for their approval. And if approved, it will become effective 20 days uh, after approval. So that would be around the May 12th, 2021 timeframe. So we're really excited about this one, especially in terms of impact on our adult learners, especially those um, you know, who are coming back um, to, to seek post-secondary uh, educational opportunities. So uh, next slide, I think I'm going to turn it over to Keelan now. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'll be able to share some uh, promising and exciting information with you as I, we transition to share with you some data that we have on uh, not only uh, what the state profile of developmental education looks like, but uh, our initial or our preliminary analysis of House Bill 2223 uh, outcomes as well. So just as a recap, I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, slide we shared with all of our presentations. However, statewide, roughly 57% of our students um, enter the doors of higher education college ready. And this is a snapshot of the fall 2019 cohort. And as you see, when it breaks out into the pie charts for two-year and four-year colleges, those look vastly different. The two-year colleges almost mirror the state themselves, and then the four-year institutions, only about 15% of students are coming through the doors underprepared. And that's easily explained due to uh, the four-year institutions having uh, more stringent admission requirements uh, juxtaposed to our two-year community and technical colleges, which in most cases are open enrollment. However, we highlight this to um, amplify the, not only the importance of the work that you do, but also to uh, help, this, help those understand that our community colleges have a very heavy lift in this work. So this particular graphic now you see the gold line or the yellow line at the bottom, the 57%, that trends with the state, that's the statewide average that you saw in the previous slide in terms of those entering the doors of higher education uh, ready in all areas. However, the three lines above it now parse that out into reading, writing, and math. And you can see over time in certain uh, subject areas, it gets a little turbulent. However, we're trending overall in the right direction, and that's upward. So particularly, I'd just like to call your attention to the light blue line right above the gold line of, uh, in 2019, 64% of that fall 2019 cohort entered the doors of higher education uh, prepared in math. So we still have some work to do there um, as opposed to 79% entering college ready in reading and 89% in writing. And just if you're wondering, Yes, with the TSIA2, we have combined we have combined reading and writing into one new section, ELAR. However, for reporting purposes, 
we'll still be looking at these as uh, three separate areas. So if you have a question about, well, they have ELAR, but they're still reporting reading, writing, and math, that, that should help clarify that. As a Thank recap, you. how... Keelan, if I could just add real quick. Um, so on the ELAR, the way that your reporting folks are uh, asked to address that in terms of CBM reporting, they're just repeat the ELAR. If it's uh, a result from the TSIA2, whatever you know, they're gonna put in the writing slot, they're just gonna repeat that same number in the reading slot. And if by chance you need additional guidance on the reporting, there is updated guidance in the CBM manual regarding the reporting of TSIA2 scores, as well as a webinar that's uh, available on the THECB YouTube channel that addresses that as well. As a recap, House Bill 2223 passed in the 85th legislative session, um, required institutions to develop and scale co-requisite models for certain underprepared uh, students. So as Suzanne said earlier, when she alluded to the scaling now for fall 2021 to 100% for at least diagnostic level five. So for math is diagnostic level five as diagnostic level six is now college ready. And for ELAR, it remains level five, six for those students that are required to be scaled or enrolled or required to be enrolled in co-requisite models. And as of fall 21, uh, 2021, just a reminder that for those populations, it is 100%. Now we'll delve into how are institutions doing with House Bill 2223. So this particular uh, representation shows, shows you that overall, many institutions met or exceeded the phased in House Bill 2223 prerequisite enrollment requirements. As a refresher, so starting with fall 2018, it was only 25% of those certain populations that were required. It went up in fall 2019 to 50%. And then in fall 2020, at uh, its scale for under House Bill 2223, as it was currently uh, passed, 75%. Um, so you'll see here that in fall 2019, overall 69% of our uh, institutions met uh, statewide in MAP and 79% for IRW. And you see the numbers broken out there for CTCs and universities as well. And here we get to the fun stuff, because when we talk about House Bill 2223, um, at its very core, it's about providing students with access to those first college level courses faster. So no longer are those uh, certain populations that are required to be enrolled um, subject to two and three levels of uh, developmental education. Now they go directly into the first college level course with that uh, intentional support attached to that college level course. So what this shows is over time, so starting with uh, fall 2017 to fall 2020, we've seen a huge increase in the number of uh, students that are being enrolled in prerequisite models. And when you look at its uh, fall 2020 numbers at 80% for math and 87%, what we want you to understand is overall as a state, because I know in the previous uh, picture, you might've noticed it's like, oh, well, some aren't meeting um, if it's not right there at that threshold. However, overall as a state, we're doing well with the uh, implementation of House Bill 2223. And most importantly, House Bill 2223 is accelerating access to first college level courses for those students that traditionally would not have been able to take those courses in their initial college semester. Access is only one part of the equation. So anytime you have uh, a mandate that requires access, the immediate thing is, well, we're forcing these underprepared students into these college level courses. Are we doing a help or a hurt? I'm so glad you asked me virtually. So. Here's some initial uh, data. So outcomes related to House Bill 2223 eligible students, again, in fall 2019 after two semesters. And I highlight after two semesters, because we wanna be honest with the data. So particularly in traditional DE, as this graphic is represented, 
it shows uh, the Burgundy line is co-requisite co-requisite models and the um, like the navy blue line is traditional developmental education but we know that those in traditional developmental education models or prerequisite models they would not have the opportunity to take the college level course in that initial semester so we're looking at um, these groups one year out so what are the outcomes for that prerequisite model that traditional de model student that's you've had a whole year to um, take that first college level course or two semesters. And what we do we see? Students in co-requisite courses meet the TSI requirements and complete the first college level courses within one year at higher rates than those in traditional DE models. So you'll see particularly, and I'll highlight math and you can look to the right for the respective numbers for uh, IRW, for math, 64% of students that were enrolled in co-requisite models met the TSI requirements within one year, juxtaposed against 42% of those in traditional DE models. Why is that, uh, you asked, Keelan? I'm so glad you asked. So with the co-requisite model, it offers the student an additional opportunity to meet the TSI benchmark. So they have their DE component that they're enrolled in or that support course. And if the institution grades those as two separate grades, the student has the opportunity to meet the TSI benchmark in that way, as well as um, their engagement or successful completion of the first college level course. They also have uh, an opportunity to meet the TSI requirement, again, with the successful completion of the first college level course. And then that's just the TSI side of it, meeting the requirement. How are they preparing in the first college level courses? And we're excited to report that the data thus far is promising that for those that were enrolled in co-requisite models, that 53% of those students, again, students traditionally that may not have been placed in that college level course in this semester <clears throat> or in these semesters or maybe in this time frame, 53% were successfully, successfully completed their first college level course in math. And that could be uh, an algebra or a non-algebra course. So we don't, uh, we haven't broken it out. Well, we, behind the scenes, we've done it. We haven't pr uh, formally presented the data to you uh, yet, but that will be forthcoming to where we'll be splitting this out to even look more granularly how students are doing in the algebra pathway versus non-algebra pathways. And you can see even after one year that only 18% of students enrolled in traditional DE models completed their first college level courses. Now, I'll let the data speak for itself on that. And again, to the right, you have uh, those numbers for reading and writing, which is now ELAR. This particular uh, table, and I know in advance it's a little busy, but we wanted to make sure, again, being honest with the data, you have the raw numbers. And from this, what we want you to take away is that from, as compared to the 2017 cohort in fall 2019, that cohort, eligible students completed 11,832 more, more gateway courses in math and 3,414 more gateway courses in reading and writing within two semesters. And again, we've broken this out by subject area and race. One of the things that we're doing uh, in our area, we're trying to be more intentional with providing you with data through an equity lens. So you can now see that we're reporting um, not only by subject area, but by race as well. And in this next representation, it's the same data. However, it shows that all groups are showing significant gains in first college level course completions. So across the board, uh, particularly with highlighting our African-American and our Hispanic students, uh, gangbusters there in terms of the number of students that are being successful in their first college level courses. And again, I cannot highlight it enough. These are students that traditionally may not have been allowed to take the college level course, those deemed underprepared. So going back to the point that uh, Suzanne highlighted earlier, looking at this data really forces us to rethink how we 
what we think about underprepared students and how we bucket them and the opportunities we feel that uh, they should have or they uh, are not ready for. So again, across the board, and that's uh, respective to MAP and IRW, that we're seeing gains in the first college level course completions across all groups. In, in the, in, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, could you go back to the last slide? Something else that I wanted to point out. Remember, each semester, each fall, more of our underprepared students are actually going into co-requisites because when we started in, you know, pre-House Bill 2223 and then fall, we only had 25% that were required to be enrolled in a co-requisite. That bumped up to 50% in the fall. Yet each so each year, when we look at the data, there are still gains, even though more students are allowed into a co-requisite. And thank you so much for highlighting that, Suzanne, because one of the biggest concerns with House Bill 2223 um, was, as we scale, are we going to see dramatic dips in the success rates of students? And that's what this data um, speaks to that still with more quote unquote or more underprepared students now entering the first college level courses that we're still seeing uh, an upward trajectory regarding their success. This particular graphic, what we want you to take away from it is now, so you've seen it in the previous slide where we've showed you um, by subject area and by race. And now we're coming back and we're gonna go on a more 30,000 foot view statewide. So at the statewide level, when we combine across subject areas, approximately 19,560 more successful completions than in, in fall 2019 for those underprepared students than in fall 2017. And again, highlighting the performance of Again, those students that are traditionally uh, more likely to be placed into developmental education, uh, black and brown students, that for uh, black students, 3,389 more successful uh, college level course completions for black students and 10,726 more for our Hispanic students. And note that we use the word, um, equity earlier. I used the word equity earlier. And we're looking at this through an equity lens. And we're getting ready to start looking at data to better understand if House Bill 2223 is, ad is addressing the equity gaps, particularly in um, developmental education, and then start to look at um, how these students are persisting. And then even one step further, and it's a conversation Suzanne and I have all the time, we've had it with uh, colleagues in major research organizations, and it's okay. So as a result of House Bill 2223, these students are being successful in their first college level course. How are they faring in that subsequent course? And we'll be even looking at those trends as well. So we're very, very pleased with the promising data that we're seeing uh, thus far and look forward to the analysis of the fall 2020 uh, cohort when that data is available and as well sharing it with you. Thank you, Suzanne. Keelan. Yeah, so uh, with our couple of minutes that we have left, um, we just wanted to highlight some of the th other things going on at the coordinating board. We have a really intensive and robust effort to increase open education resources with our OER um, grant program. The specific focus is on building out more career technical education options and options for co-requisites. Uh, we are also concentrating really heavily on improving advising and building a state, statewide framework together with our colleagues at PEA and TWC, a statewide advising framework. And some key components of that is our virtual chatbot, ADVI, which is short for advisor. And you can see the um, email, uh, I'm sorry, the URL address is there. And Texas OnCourse, which houses um, a lot of the training videos and the training opportunities and, and badging opportunities uh, for our counselors, not only our counselors, but also our 
higher education uh, advisors. And then um, of course we have our Texas Works internship program. Those have been, those have just recently launched and we're really excited about that. Um, bring, you know, this, these are going to be opportunities, paid internship opportunities for our students who are getting ready to graduate to in, in improve and increase their career readiness. Of course, we continue to uh, work and uh, build out our Texas uh, Public Higher Education Almanac, and the link is there. And then um, some of the um, uh, bills that are being considered at the legislative session. Of course, we have our Texas uh, reskilling and upskilling initiative called TRUE, and uh, that is uh, efforts that include grad techs and other efforts that are really trying to focus on our uh, unemployed and underemployed population, and especially those who do have some college credit to bring them back to our universities and to our colleges and help them complete. Um, also, there are quite a number of bills like they are every session that either want to um, eliminate altogether the end of course exams, the EOCs, or reduce them to uh, just focus on uh, the English and the math required uh, by federal, uh, uh, the, the federal ESSA requirements. Um, and also uh, uh, several grants to support regional collaboratives and so we're really excited. Um, of course, our role right now is to uh, look at those bills and provide an analysis. And those hearings are going on as we speak um, at the Capitol. Um, many of those hearings, or I believe all of those hearings, are open to the public. So I invite you to, to you know, whenever you can, to listen in and 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 hear um, the debates and to to hear the the testimony, uh, both for and against a lot of these bills. Next slide. And I just wanted to again highlight um, our uh, developmental ed college uh, readiness and success initiatives. And um, we're getting ready to uh, award our, uh, to, to put out our grant uh, opportunity, our next solicitation for our next round of college readiness and success models. Um, our developmental education and uh, uh, professional development priorities continue to be enhancing and scaling co requisites and really focusing on improving advising. And we also wanted to let you know that we do have some external evaluation projects going on with edu policy, which will be uh, uh, evaluating House Bill 2223 and its implementation, and a multiple measures assessment study with CAPR. We're, we're uh, partnering with them on a multiple measures assessment of the, uh, study. So for either of those, um, you may have folks from edu policy and CAPR contacting your institution. So we highly uh, recommend that you consider participating because um, you know you're the you're the boots on the ground folks and all of the hard work that you're doing. Certainly, we want to be able to gauge that success, especially as we consider uh, future uh, policy uh, recommendations. Next slide. So here, uh, Keelan, in his uh, really technological prowess, has put our QR scanning code if you're interested and if you haven't already signed up to receive updates. And uh, I believe we're on our last slide, just our contact information. Oh, uh, just a, another slide here with our resources. Of course, we have our webpage. Uh, we have a number of our webinars that are on our YouTube channel. And then the AccuPlacer student portal. These are the student resources for the TSIA. And of course, this includes uh, an ability for the student to have agency over retrieving his or her scores, uh, TSIA practice, and uh, tutorials on how to use the calculators that are part of the assessment, as well as a highlighter feature. Now we have our contacts. <laughs> so thank you. And um, Richard, I believe we're going to go ahead and toss it over uh, in, in your court and um, see if we have any questions that have been coming in. Yes, well, uh, Suzanne, Keelan, thank you so much for this information. Um, I've been getting a lot of calls in my office about these issues for, for some time. And uh, I think we really have our, our best resources here. I, I, I feel like rather than trying to deliver these messages secondhand, it's a lot better coming from y'all directly and uh, giving our, our members this chance to have 
this sort of exchange. We do have a question in the chat section um, asking, uh, when using multiple measures for a student who does not have a TSIA score, can you confirm whether it is required for the student to take the TSIA two before the end of the semester? Yes, um, we can confirm the answer to that would be yes. Now, we still do understand um, while it is becoming better and while we understand we're hearing, you know, getting feedback from our institutional stakeholders that are really planning to bring most of these um, resources back online, the testing centers, of course, uh, back online in person in the fall. Um, it still may be a difficulty for some students. However, uh, the rule does require that the student needs to take the assessment by the end of the term. And so you want to go into your advising and the conversations you're having with students early so they're, they're not surprised by that later. Yes, and of course, we want to remind everyone, unlike like some of the other assessments, um, the TSIA is available and the TSIA too, of course, we use those interchangeably now. Um, they are definitely available for remote proctoring circumstances. So even when a student uh, you know, is not able to come to your campus or in the likely case, if your testing center isn't open or isn't open, you know, uh, the typical hours uh, that they used to be and more on a limited basis, there is remote proctoring available. Suzanne, just to further clarify the answer to that question, specifically if an institution is using a COVID waiver, because that was one of the questions that we got early on with the use of the COVID waiver. And uh, you've shared that we'll be reverting back uh, to the TSI rules as far as placement for fall 22 placements. But if an institution is using uh, the COVID waiver, uh, multiple measures to place students in college level courses, what options may they have in determining whether or not to have that student to test? In terms of if the student is doing well in the college level course, would that student be required to test? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Keelan, for reminding me. That's a very important point. So, so, Hillary, to answer that question in a little more nuanced way, if the student is doing well, uh, you know, and, and you, of course, you could determine, determine locally what that means, uh, most institutions would count doing well as the student passing with an A, B, or C, um, then they you do not need to force that student to take the TSIA if the student is actually doing well in the college course. Interesting. I that. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, I have a question um, that uh, I think you may have touched on earlier, but uh, it's something that I've, I've heard from a number of, of our members having to do with cut scores on <clears throat> the different levels of, uh, of the, those tiers that, that are short of college readiness. How do y'all uh, think about those cut scores? Are they, is that something that y'all evaluate regularly? Uh, what, what elements might adjustments in the cut scores be sensitive to? Um, uh, because I, I know some of our members are wanting to make sure that, that if they're in a co-rec course, that they're, that, uh, they're proximity to college readiness uh, is, is suitable for them. Yeah, um, Richard, we, we touched on that a little bit um, in terms of really recommending institutions have more than one co-requisite option and to really parse out those students who are at the higher level. And uh, for that, you know, we can ask a faculty to consider both the CRC score, so the 910 to 990 score, uh, you know, of course, it would be under below the college readiness indicator. So a combination of that and then also how they did on each of the four strand areas, because that information is available in the diagnostic as well. That plus other indicators, if the faculty choose to do that. But those uh, those indicators together, again, would kind of parse out those students who we, we would call near college ready versus those who have uh, demonstrated lower le skill levels. And so we, we say at least, offer at least two options. One would be a very, uh, you know, short-term one to two maximum SCH. And the other one would be more of a robust model. Um, so that would be one way. And then um, in the uh, previous assessment, 
we know many institutions were actually using the CRC score back then, you know, the 310 to 390 score um, below the college readiness benchmark and then determining placements on that. We really are encouraging institutions to get away from that. So using that 910 to get away from using the 910 to 990, notwithstanding the example I gave earlier, but really focusing on the diagnostics, especially now that the diagnostic, you know, it's not as confusing as it was when you previously had two diagnostics. We have one diagnostic now, and those, the, the faculty, the standard setting process, the faculty spent a lot of time really parsing out you, you know, those college readiness and, and the, the various levels, even to the point where they felt very confident um, in the math, for example, to, to uh, recommend that level six be considered another second chance college readiness indicator, something that wasn't available on the previous assessment. So really focusing on the diagnostic and strand information and then making um, those recommendations based on that as well. So Suzanne. Real yes. quick, just one clarification on um, the standard setting. So although that was a recommendation uh, of the faculty, um, I want, we want everybody to understand that it wasn't an arbitrary pick that we picked the highest diagnostic level score. It's psychometrically aligned to the 950 on the college readiness classification test. So the diagnostic test is calibrated to the same ability scale as the college readiness classification tests. So that's a question that we get off times. It's like, well, it's diagnostic level one through six. Y'all just pick the highest level. Not so much. It's literally aligned uh, psychometrically in terms of the calibration of the scales for the diagnostic and the CRC, which was not the case with its predecessor, the TSIA. Thank you, Keelan, for... Yeah, that's helpful to see what what is it based on. <clears throat> it's not just a a, a made up number <laughs> that it that it's uh, it's it's connected to something. And uh, I I think I'm hearing connect, uh, correct me if I'm wrong that you're really uh, advocating for a more holistic view of the student uh, than than just one number. Um, am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Richard. Even um, sure now, you know, that we're using multiple measures assessment, but even let's just say, you know, we, we didn't have that available. Um, we still consider the whole uh, assessment process, not only the different ways that, uh, you know, a student can earn an exemption, if you will, but also the fact that our assessment isn't just one number. It, the CRC is, yes, it is that to determine whether the student needs to um, be uh, exposed to more items via a diagnostic, but once you get that into that diagnostic, there are not only those strand, you know, you get an overall diagnostic level, but you also get those individual strand uh, indicators to help uh, give that additional information. Well, that, that's good to know. And it's something that um, th there's clarity in, uh, in make, having boil down to one number. Uh, it's just a very clear, did you, are you above the number or below it? Uh, but you're, you're saying if, if you're really looking at the whole student, um, you, you need to look at all these and, and assess what's best. Uh, but that does mean that each faculty member in each institution needs to um, uh, go about this process, exercise good judgment, and, uh, and, and base their decisions on what's in the best interest of the student. Um, we do have... Uh, some more questions that are coming in, some that were submitted on the Google form. Uh, let me read a couple of these. Uh, we've got a few minutes here. Um, uh, let's see, how do we get on the TSIA2 update webinar? The current event is about racial justice. Um, uh, thank you. Can you please provide clarity on the situation in, that, in which a student is college credit for composition? exempting them from TSI writing requirements, but does not have college credit for reading. The choices available for testing combinations do not allow for ELAR uh, multiple choice and, and math without essay. Are institutions still going to require two college level courses, one reading, one writing, to clear students in LAAR? Or are some institutions going to use only one college level course to clear that section? Um, so there's a lot there, there's some more to it, but there's a lot right there. Uh, 
why don't you respond to that? Keelan, you worked very closely <laughs> with, <laughs> yeah, with like faculty. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, you even developed, we even developed a, a, a document to help with the guidance on that. So I'll start with the situation where a student has, uh, let's just say they've completed uh, coursework to meet the writing requirement, but they have not met the reading requirement. And this is actually something we went back and forth on, but our original guidance was like prior to the decision that was made, which um, actually served as the catalyst for the retest options document, prior to December, all of our guidance had been, if the students were not met in both reading and writing, they would have to retest on the ELAR. However, uh, with, since there was no change to the essay portion only, um, we, and after numerous conversations, we opted, okay, let's give those students uh, credit. However, if the student is already met in writing, the student would be eligible pending their, um, if they met the bench, if they met it through coursework and they don't have uh, reading, they would have to take the full test because in order to meet the ELAR benchmark, they need the CRC score as well as the essay score. It's conjunctive. And that's one of the pieces that we're aware of. Uh, I respond to those questions uh, probably at least once or twice a week. But however, if the student has not met the reading portion, understand that the institution has options. You can use um, their current placement scores. And if INRW, as a support, it has to be integrated at the highest level and paired with the college level course. So then that's how they could meet the TSI reading requirement juxtaposed of putting them through the gauntlet of, oh, go retest, go retest, go retest. So if in a more nuanced way for this particular question, I would say reach out to us. It's a little hard to kind of walk you through the nuances um, without a specific case in front of me, although you would argue it's like, well, I gave you a very specific case, but <laughs> pending the options available at your in respective institution to provide you with uh, guidance on the most appropriate way to address the situation, particularly and with, um, and we, are, we, we were on the fence about this statement with the student's best interest uh, in mind. Suzanne and I were going back and forth about this on yesterday, but to make the best decision for the student in terms of if they need to retest and if so, uh, what options are available to them, feel free to reach out to us. But at its very core, they're outlined uh, in the retest document, retest options document that's on the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board's DE and TSI uh, webpage. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for pointing out that resource, Keelan, because we tried to, you know, uh, think of the most common sort of standardized scenarios that, that you know, stakeholders were asking about. And we included that in the document. But as Keelan mentioned, sometimes um, we're not really getting to, to answer your institution's questions because your institution, each institution has a, a variety of options that they can uh, offer to their students. And since that is not mandated or streamlined, you know, you have that institutional flexibility. Sometimes the best way we can address some of these answers is to uh, find out what those options are at your institution. And we're more than happy to, to set up a, a quick meeting with your faculty or with your um, testing folks uh, or advisors, whoever you think. And we can walk through those various options so that your institution serves the underprepared students in the most optimal way. And that's, that's, that's a wonderful resource uh, to be able to talk with you directly about, are, are, we, are we in line with, with uh, what the underlying intent with all this. Uh, I think short of just more time with this, more experience with it, uh, that's probably the best way to, to get to where we're, we're all trying to be on this. Um, I, there is a question here that uh, is asking, uh, what do you anticipate the increase in need for developmental reading and writing will be with the change in the passing essay score from four to five? Is there relevant data from when the score previously changed from five to four? 
Yeah, so actually, you know, we are, uh, as you mentioned, Richard, and as we talked about earlier, we are tracking very closely, I mean, the data on them. As, as soon as the month finishes, we, we meet up with the college board psychometricians and researchers, and we're reviewing the data constantly. Um, so far, there is no indicator that more students are testing not college ready when it comes to the ELAR when compared to the reading and writing. Even with moving the uh, the essay score back to the five. Um, and of course, the reasoning behind that was when we combined the test, we now had fewer test questions. And so we put a little bit more heavily weight, heavy weight on the essay result to uh, compensate for the, the fewer test questions on the uh, uh, college readiness portion, the first 20 questions, if you will, the first 30 questions on ELAR. Now, we are tracking that very closely, and we will continue to track that. And one other important point that I wanted to mention, um, when the TSIA was first launched, we didn't co conduct our validity study until four, almost five years in after launch. With this uh, version, we are actually going to be conducting the study, beginning the study, the validity study, one year after launch. So, uh, you know, and it takes roughly four months or so to, to do all of the various components and then to complete that, yeah. that process. So we do anticipate having uh, the validity study available next summer. And of course that will play a key role in making any changes to these benchmarks. And especially, you know, when it comes to, for, for example, the level four student in math that we mentioned earlier. And also of course, considering the, essay score in combination of the new LAR portion. Well, and that I think probably adds to the urgency of the, the that feedback loop, that if people have questions, being able to get it answered readily from y'all is probably gonna give you better data after a year instead of taking years to get used to a system. Um, so uh, I would encourage anyone watching this webinar uh, uh, to take them up on this offer uh, to, for conversations. So uh, please do that. Uh, one last quick question. Um, do you think the College Board Bridge will become a coordinating board approved multiple measure? Uh, I'm not really sure if I'm following the question. Keelan? I believe uh, they're referring to Texas College Bridge. Was it, say that one more time, Richard. It says Texas College Bridge. Okay, yeah. So the Texas College Bridge is a uh, option for use under the college prep course um, statute. So that's section 28014. And of course, successful completion of a college prep course is a TSI, uh, qualifies a student for a TSI exemption. Um, there's a couple of other stipulations associated with that, but that continues to be available. And, um, you, know, any, uh, you know, the way the college prep course uh, statute is written, it is a local determination. Um, and we understand that there are a number of consortia that have been developed who are uh, sharing their MOUs. And so we are also working with TEA to track that data closely. Um, but so far it sounds like it is a really good option for students. So. We're excited about, you know, seeing seeing what the opportunities are for students with with regard to the Texas College Bridge. Terrific, uh, y'all. Uh, there's just been a tremendous amount of really valuable information on a on a complicated and thorny topic of how do we uh, how do we uh, unravel all this and make sure we all make the same sense out of it. Um, and I don't think there's any substitute for from hearing directly from y'all. Uh, we are planning to continue this conversation throughout the coming year, uh, this summer and into the fall, um, with, uh, with both of y'all, hopefully, uh, to uh, help our members get up to speed, get their questions answered, get feedback from them on how it's working and uh, what they're finding as well. So uh, I hope everybody who's tuned in today will join us for those conversations. Be looking on the TCCTA website for more information. Um, uh, as information comes out, uh, y'all feel free to share it with us. We'll post it on our blog and other channels that we have to communicate with members. Make sure that it gets out directly to the field so that faculty know what's happening and uh, what they need uh, to be successful in this. So uh, I, I think this is the conversation that's probably 
uh, going to put us in the best position to uh, to accomplish uh, what we're all looking at here. Uh, there is so much change happening uh, right now on so many levels. Uh, I mean, even before COVID came along, <laughs> uh, we're, we're just dealing with with uh, change upon change. Um, but I think the the more clarity we can have about it, the the better result we're going to get to. The less confusion there will be uh, around these changes. So please, uh, everyone. I know y'all are busy in your classrooms, in your departments, but if you'll take a little minute uh, here and there uh, to join with us, I, I think it'll be well worth, worth your time. So uh, Suzanne and Keenan, Keelan, thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to future conversations around this and uh, any updates you'll find, uh, please share them with, with us so we can make sure everybody knows uh, what y'all know on this. Yes, thank you so much again, Richard, and uh, thank you to TCCTA for inviting us. Good to see you.